This is episode number 472 of the Health and Fitness Podcast by Innerfight. Brought to you in association with Smith Street Paleo. Hop over to smithstreetpaleo.com, check out all the yummy food. And of course, if you are looking for a meal plan provider, someone that provides your food daily, takes away the headache of you having to prepare it yourself, good, healthy, wholesome paleo food, then they are the people. Hello at smithstreetpaleo.com is who you need to be in touch with. I really enjoyed this talk in this podcast, 472, with best-selling author, Brian Falcher. Welcome back to another edition of the podcast, folks, and I am super excited. We have another guest the other week, we we're all the way down in Australia. We've now gone to the other side of the globe. And joining me, another Skype call is Brian Falter. Brian, all the way from Boston. How are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing really well, Marcus. Thanks for having me on. Mate, thank you so much. I don't want to, I've got your bio, but I want you to tell us who you are and what's going on because I think that's the best way to kick things off. Yeah, and there's kind of nothing more awkward than sitting there while someone reads your bio while you're, yeah. <laughs> while you're listening in, um, especially if you're the one who wrote it. Yeah. Uh, um, so, <laughs> so I'm. Um, it's interesting. I to describe myself. This is the first show I'm doing since I left my job, so I got to think about how I describe myself a little bit differently. But uh, I'm the, then the the reason why I'm here. I'm an author and uh, public speaker and, and coach on the idea of overcoming your greatest challenges and achieving what you really seek. And it really comes from a place of introspection. So getting right. people to like, as a coach, I get to be really annoying and just keep asking people why, 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 like whatever answer they give, I'm just going to ask you why, cause we got to dig deeper. Yeah. And that's kind of what my whole approach is about. And, and, to look within yourself and discover what actually matters, what actually drives you, what's standing in the way of getting where you want to go and get over it. You know, like not, not forget about it or who cares. It's like, how do you actually work through it and make it no longer a barrier in your life? And, uh, I've had a bunch of experiences that brought me through to that. And I know we'll get into that kind of stuff. Uh, So yeah, this hasn't always been your, 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 your job. Like you said, you've just recently moved into this. So take us back. What was your, what was your career? Yeah. So I've spent 20 years in the insurance industry, um, which usually is a conversation ender right there. People are like, all right. You know, I, say, like, I met my wife when I was unemployed at business school because be, having no job and being in debt is way more attractive than, hi, I'm Brian. I work in insurance. Uh, Brilliant. But I, I, yeah, I, I had a great career. Um, you know, I, I did I did very well. I moved up quickly. Um, I got into the C-suite of a public company, you know, in my 30s. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. And I loved what I did. Um but it wasn't where my passion was. It wasn't where my heart was. Right. And uh, as much as I loved it, you know, as, as time goes on and as my jobs got bigger and bigger, it, it's harder and harder to put that much of yourself into something when you know what you actually want to do. Yeah. And so um, we're recording this on what, October 29th. Yeah. Um, it was three weeks ago today. That was wow. my last, last day in that in that corporate life. Um, Unbelievable. So I took this leap full time. I've been doing this on the side since 2011. Right. But uh, enough is enough. You know, if I'm going to do this, I got to do it. You got to do it full time. Mate, talk to us a little bit about that because I think there's that your story is it's, it's, it's different to mine, but it's no different to mine. I was also in the corporate world and I started working on something on the side. And then, you know, we saw it, we sort of take, take the plunge and you're three weeks in, I think I'm about eight years in now and everything's yeah. going, everything's going yeah. great for both of us. But what's the process and what's the tipping point and how does it like, cause I get a question a lot from people like, how do you know? And how do you make it happen to give up the, the, and let's not be too harsh on the corporate world because it does a lot of good for, for a lot of us, but how do you know when's the yeah. right time to go and how do you make it happen? Well, so this is one that is a hundred percent a personal decision and it's driven by really more than anything else It's driven by your aversion to risk. Right. How comfortable are you? you taking those leaps. And some people are like, I'm going to go cold turkey. I don't have anything lined up. You know, there's nothing brewing with what I want to be doing, but I'm just going to go do it. And there's people are like, oh, you should totally quit your job and just, just go for it. And that's when it all falls in place. Like, yeah, possibly. 
I also have a young child and I have a wife who has a chronic illness who the thing that sparked do a day and, and, you know, everything that ultimately led us to this conversation, um, she was on her deathbed in 2011. She wasn't expected to make it through the summer wow. and, um, she's not at that point anymore. She survived, but it's a daily thing. And that means, you know, medical bills for us are, are a pretty major component of our expenses. And so for me to just quit my job with no, no brewing other income, yeah. that's not, you know, there's just a, a rationality to that, that like, that's probably not the best idea. <laughs> so I'm, I'm inherently going to be a bit more risk averse because there's two other lives that depend on me. Yeah. You know, if it's just me. I'll, you know, I'm all in whatever savings, like, let's go for it. And I get that. I probably would still be a little bit more conservative. Like, look, I looked at, I work in insurance for 20 years. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, that, that's train that way, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But um, you know what I also recognize? It's like going on a diet. Anyone you talk to about going on a diet, it's never the right time. There's always right. someone's birthday parties coming up or, <laughs> oh, but we've got that dinner or it's date night or, you know, like it, whatever it is, there's always some reason why, you know, someone brought bagels into work today. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, there's always there's always food around, That's kind of the nature of food for, you know, not for everyone on the planet, but yeah. for certainly the people probably listening here and. And the kind of people in my world, like they're not starving. Yeah. So there's always going to be that temptation. There's always some reason not to take the leap. And I think for the people who are like, you just have to go do it, just, you know, rip the bandaid off and go. I think that's probably more what their point is, whether they realize it or not. It's like there is never a right time. All so right. stop looking for perfection. And at some point, if you know what you want to do and you believe in yourself, you should take the leap. And I, I, I definitely appreciate that message. What so why did it come to a head and why are you three weeks into having I mean yeah. obviously yeah you have and and, and we man, I can't wait to jump into your book and all all of what's sort of happened and and the story about your wife it's it really is incredible but yeah. what made it happen three weeks ago because you still have bills you still have a family for sure so there's a, a couple of things and some of it is is great and some of it is less great um, this has been brewing for a while so my book came out in March of 2017 and since then. Um, I've really been going hard on both sides of my life. So, you know, my day job was a big job. It's gotten significant or it got <laughs> past tense, yeah. significantly bigger. So like the company I joined, um, you know, three years before leaving was half the size of the company I left. My team was three si three times bigger. Wow. Um, so, you know, I went from being uh, tired, but able to manage both sides of, you know, both of my careers to my day jobs, probably like 80 hours. And for people who work, 40 or 40 to 50 hours, 80 may not sound like that much more, but it's not linear. <laughs> yeah. Like it is, that is yeah. a significant, I mean, do the math on how many hours a day that is. That's a significant amount of work. And, yeah. uh, and it took a toll on me. And I was away five days a week from home because my job was on, you know, halfway across the country. Wow. Um, so it, it really was starting to burn me out. And at the same time, you know, the book, the book did well. My coaching was doing doing well. I did a couple of TED talks. I was speaking more like the demands on me in my second career, which where my passion was, were growing and growing. And my two worlds were very much butting heads. Right. So I found myself less and less able to put time into what I wanted to be doing. And so then it's like, I felt like I was holding myself back. So, it, you know, there was sort of a, I knew there'd be a reckoning. I mean, you get to the end of the book and I talk about that, but like yeah. ultimately I didn't yeah. want to do this full time. And that, it's going to come to a head. And that's what happened. Now, the, the, the less good side of it was there were some tough things going on at work from a um, result standpoint. And you know, I'm not going to get into all that, but yeah. essentially like, you know, the, the time was, was like, well, that opens the door for me to leave anyway. So uh, let me, let me take that opportunity. Cause I, I had sort of put April of 2019 in my head. I wasn't telling anyone at work that, um, <laughs> and it looked like I could do it earlier. So I, I did it. It's six months difference. Amazing. Um, well, mate, is that can... really going to make a difference? <laughs> no, exactly. Well, mate, Not listen, bill paying, you know, yeah. Yeah. congratulations for, for doing it. Let's jump back into your book. Your book is called do a day. Talk us through it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's uh basically, for how to live that um, I wish I discovered like academically and, and have just lived this perfect life, but that's not reality and no one really has that going on. I discovered it through firsthand experience with my own struggles and um, you know, my backstory people, I did a book signing yesterday and 
you know, no one who came up to me knew me. So they didn't know my story. I see this guy and it says like vegan and marathoner and whatever. Um, I used to weigh a hundred pounds more than I do right now. Right. Um, you know, they certainly wouldn't have expected, and I was a kid. So, you know, like <laughs> height for height, it, it would be like me weighing another 130 pounds. Uh. Uh, so, you know, significantly obese from a really early age, and it had nothing to do with eating too much and moving too little. Those were symptoms as much as being obese was. Mm. It was from a place of really extreme anxiety. Um, my parents split up when I was really little and looked at, that doesn't make me special. It doesn't make me different. That's just my experience. Mm. And I struggled with it. And, and I didn't I didn't feel what little kids need to feel. And that's safe and secure and taken care of. And uh my parents, for a variety of reasons, like having three other kids in the household and having their own stuff to deal with with the divorce, they couldn't really be there for me. And frankly, I couldn't really express what I was thinking and feeling because I was too little. I was like five years old. Yeah. You know, I didn't understand. Um, I didn't know what divorce was or what it all meant. I just felt uncomfortable. So I turned to food hard and fast. And I put on, you know, this wasn't like slow and steady a couple pounds a year. You look at a picture of me from like, five years old to six years old. And it's like, I'm already obese at six. Wow. So it's like, you know, any of those, those, um, inspirational quotes are like, you didn't, you know, you didn't gain a hundred pounds in one year or in one month. You shouldn't expect to lose it in one month. Right. I kind of did. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad. But yeah. I mean, like I weighed more than any of my teachers in elementary school. Wow. That's not right. You know? Yeah. Um, so that, that's my backstory. And, I lost weight through a different relationship with exercise that this incredible guy who ran the uh, physical education program in my high school taught. Um, he taught me just a different relationship with it. It's not about you're fat and lazy and slow and what's wrong with you, which is what exercise was to me. Yeah. It was, what do you enjoy? You know, let, let's, let's try different things and see what you enjoy doing. And can, you know, can you find something self-sustaining because you actually want to do it? Um, and that was like my, I'd never, heard of exercise existing like that and so we created a program and you know very self-love and and um confidence kind of approach um he's, he's got a great mix of confidence and humility that you just it can be rare to find and it was so inspiring it helped me to change but i never dealt with the anxiety right and so that's why like a ton of people who lose weight i put on by the time my wife got sick, I was halfway back to where I was. I was about 50 pounds overweight again. Um, and I was miserable. You know, the anxiety was still there. I was, everything was wrong. Everything was being done to me. You know, it was always like the sky's about to fall and I'm constantly running around like a chicken with its head cut off, mm -hmm. trying to like flailing to stop things from going wrong. And that's just like who in their right mind wants to live like that. <laughs> yeah. Does that just not sound attractive at all? No, not really at all, no. <laughs> so that's that's the context for this moment. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't change. My wife was trying to tell me like, you know, you should go and talk to someone about the divorce and you know, from, like it was twenty something years or twenty seven years ago. Like I don't need to talk to anyone. And she was smart enough to know that I did, but I had every excuse in the book. It's like there's so much on my plate already. I can't do that. Uh, I would say like, yeah, not with that attitude. Like if you say you can't do it, guess what? <laughs> You're not going to do it. Yeah. Um, so then there, there came a moment where I didn't have a choice. And, um, that was the summer of 2011. She got really sick. She's got a chronic illness that we didn't know about. It reared its head. Our son was two. And, um, she started losing two pounds a day. She was in intense pain. She became bedridden. Um, and on June 30th, her doctor called me to tell me he was going on vacation for six weeks and he'd check in when he's back. And I'm like, she weighs, I think at that point she was 104 pounds, losing, still losing two pounds a day. Wow. Um, can't get out of bed. Can't take care of herself at that point. Um, and I was like, doctor, do the math. She doesn't have six weeks. And he just goes, oh, okay, we'll take her to the emergency room if you need to. And he hung up. <sighs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> So he's, I always say like, he's not our doctor anymore. If he did <laughs> yeah, that was, the, that was the last time we were patients. Of his. Um, but I, I walked back into our bedroom and, you know, my wife's in bed and our son's in there. Uh, he, I don't know what he's doing. He's just like standing there looking at his mother and he's basically watching her die in front of his eyes. And he turns and looks at me and like when his eyes met mine, that was my moment. That was it. Everything just hit me in the face and, and, 
And the only way I can really describe is this very strong sense of like, what the hell are you doing? Like, right. Why are you living this way? You know, this woman's suffering and you're so busy freaking out about everything that's wrong and what you have to do that you can't just be there and listen when she needs to talk about how hard this is. Wow. And this little boy, you know, is watching his mother die. Like you're, you're not being the kind of father he needs. If he's only going to have one parent, he has no shot at happiness with that one parent being you. Oof. That's heavy. <laughs> that's that, heavy. That's, yeah, I know. Like, that's a, that's a kick in the gut. Yeah. I, I love him more than anything. And so to feel, to feel like I'm failing him in such a big way, like his chance at happiness in life. And I mean, you know, look at what I went through and that was just divorce, you know? So talk about not feeling like things are going to be okay. Losing your mother when you're two, that's way more impactful. And I'm the only chance he has at coping with that and, and getting through that. And I'm, I'm just not doing that for him. Wow. And the, the piece that took me a lot longer. And, um, I mean, even writing the book, and I don't know which version of it you read, if you read the revised edition or the original print, right. uh, but putting out the original, it was still all about him. And it was doing a podcast when I had a, a host who challenged me. He's like, you're talking about your son as your motivation, but you have these rules about motivation. It's got to be inside of you. And, you know, the feeling of being a parent is, is very much, you know, that's in me. My love for my son is in me, but it's still about something external. And so it took that challenge, what, six years later for me to get that there's another layer to this onion I haven't peeled back yet. And that's about me. And it was this like, you know, when I was saying before, like, who wants to live a life like that? Yeah, That's what it's really about is what do I actually want my life to be? And, and like that matters. Yeah. You know, that's it, not something I ever felt like my life actually matters. Yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult though, because you, you obviously had a situation that creates that point and that realization that you, you matter. And like you said, that life matters, but sometimes people are just, and you probably find this and I'm sure you've got some thoughts on it. People are just, they don't feel that it matters. They don't feel that they matter. And that it, it, they don't make any changes. They're not, not making the changes. Yeah. And I, I absolutely find that. And so the, the building blocks that I have, like the, the book split in three pieces. The first is a number of chapters, I call them days, yeah. um, with different situations, different um, like roles or, or aspects of life where do a day comes into play. And they're just examples from my own experience. The reality is it applies to anything you allow it to apply to. But I go through marathon training and diet with the example of, of how I went vegan, which is how the book actually got its name, um, being a parent, difficulties at work, like all these different situations in the first part. And it's sort of like through the case method, you learn what do a day is about. The second part is the building blocks, the actual pieces you need to put it into play in your life. Yeah. And then the third third section is some really practical examples like here are some of the main things that people have been coming to me about which incidentally have completely changed since the book came out, but it used to all be about like wellness and, and diet and exercise examples of how to apply it there. But in the second chapter, the second section, when I re-released the book, I added something that I, I still can't believe wasn't there originally, but it's on, on self love. And that's yeah. the first and single most important piece of the whole puzzle. Cause without it, nothing else we talk about matters. If you don't think you're good enough, capable of, and deserving of better, then it like none of this other work is ever going to matter. It might matter in the short term, but it's not going to keep you going through the toughest moments, through the times where people are doubting you. You're, you know, you've got moments of doubt in yourself or you fail because something is going to creep in and eat away at your sense of yourself. And if you don't have a strong sense of yourself, then the game's kind of over ultimately. Yeah. So that's like in my coaching Self-love, single most important thing I work on. And I, I always say, like, people get squeamish. They don't like the phrase. That's cool. Call it whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, call it something really tough. Yeah, yeah. Like, call it weightlifting. Or, <laughs> like, I don't care. Yeah. But you got to do it. You got to do it. We have to have more self-love. And that doesn't mean egotism. It just, there's a difference between that and actually valuing yourself. Mate, when you speak about... Like in, in the book, it's, it's a lot about a day at a time and, 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 and obviously with the situation with your wife, it's about getting through that particular day. How do you, how do you help people to 
live on that day and because the, the the human instinct is to it's not i won't say it's to worry but people do think about the future people like you were saying before you've yeah. got you've got medical bills to pay so you're thinking about well will i have enough money in six months how what's your sort of go-to advice if you like on getting people just to think about that day and just getting through that day as opposed to worrying about what's coming yeah. So, I mean, this is this is where a lot of the debate comes in because it serves us well to be aware of what's coming and everyone will back that up and be like, oh, but, you know, then I can plan ahead. And I, I hear all that. And so oh, I'm not opposed to knowing what's out there. Like I'm aware of what's still out there. It's about whether I'm going to basically like sit here and ruminate on it. So you can be as aware of everything that's out there as you want to be or can handle. And there's there is value in that. Right. And especially like with goals, goals are all in the future. So totally like it's OK to have an idea of what's out in the future. I'm not saying become ignorant to what's out there. That's mm -hmm. definitely not the approach. Right. What it's about is you can know about it, but you have to put it in its place and get back to kicking some butt today because right. it's not the future. So what are you going to do right now? Whatever you're going to do right now may help the future, but it's not for, it's not. And a future action. It's a right now action. So you have to focus on the outcome today, the actions today, the the thing you're trying to achieve today, not whether you've got something that may kick you in the face in six months, because you don't know what's actually going to happen. Yeah. And what's really important is when you live your life focused on all those bad things you're trying to stop from happening or like brace yourself or where, where they hit you, you, you probably make them come true. <laughs> Versus if you are aware of them, but if you free yourself from it and you make your actions about achievement today, those things may never come to pass. Yeah. So I, like, I'm I not really worried about my mortgage, you know, a year from now. I'm just like, I need to kick some butt today. I need to get a speaking gig or sell more copies of my book or whatever. It is. Like yesterday, I wasn't desperate about selling copies of my book because how am I going to pay my mortgage in February 2019? Yeah. Which incidentally, like the economics of selling books, there's no chance I'm going to pay my mortgage in any month of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, It doesn't work out too like, well, does it? <laughs> no. And then like what kind of an inspirational person am I going to be to the people who come up to my table yesterday? And like I had a woman in tears about it, – it wasn't her. It was her best friend who she was buying the book for lost her son, a child. Right. Um, and it's just devastated her. I'm like – if I'm sitting here freaking out about paying my bills, do you really think I'm going to make the connection with her that her friend desperately needs me to make? Nah. So you have to let go of those things if you want to achieve the most today. And making that connection will help me down the road, and it could lead to more things and all that. So it's like let go of the anxiety-driven decisions. Make a positivity-driven decision, an achievement-driven decision in the right now. Don't let anxiety be the reason why you do anything because I guarantee you that will not be the right thing to do. Yeah, I think that's super important. Actually, on, 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 on last week's show, uh, number 468, we had uh, former World Ironman champion uh, Pete Jacobs. He won Kona oh. in 2012, and he was talking a lot about – he's a, a big fan of uh, Eckhart Tolle and the power of, the power of now – and that's something mm -hmm. that, I mean, like you say, those things are going to happen. And I think it's super like, but you can't, you can't influence them now. Um, and, and he's, he said, even at the top end of professional sport, like just being able to create that moment and to create the now is one of the techniques that he thinks helped him to get to the top of his sport as well. Um, so that was, yeah, that was I'm a, sure. super interesting. But I, I completely agree with you, mate. I think a lot of the time we, we, we put things in our mind like uh, tomorrow is going to be a bad day and we tell, we tell ourselves tomorrow is going to be a bad day. So our brain almost goes to work to create the picture that we've told ourselves is going to happen, you know, and we – so tomorrow is definitely going to be a bad day if you're already thinking about it today – and telling yourself it's going to be a bad day, which is something that you sort of alluded to a little bit earlier there. Yeah, completely. Um, and it's, I was just watching a show where like there, the people were working in a restaurant and one of the waitresses like dropped all of the plates and they broke. And she's like, what is it with today? I'm like, you know what? Plates break every day. <laughs> you just notice that they're breaking it. And like, yeah, maybe they didn't, she didn't break any plates yesterday, but like stuff happens. There's always things happening. Yeah. Generally speaking, most days are not like 
all worse or all better than other days. It's just a question of your perspective. So when you've told yourself it's a bad day, you're going to notice the bad stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. uh it, it, it's it's like when you buy a particular kind of car, you start noticing that car on the road. Like when you framed in your mind that today is about bad, you spot it. You spot it's it. It's familiar to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mate, so that's obviously a, a little bit on topic for me at the moment. You're running marathons. You, yeah. you went sort of from obesity to running a marathon and, and applying this these principles that you've learned. Talk us through that experience a little bit. Yeah, so I think marathon training for me, and again, certainly what you're doing right now, um, that's like the that and weight loss seem to be the two perfect analogies or like situations to describe what do a day is about. Because I, I don't know if we we should talk about what you're doing or we shouldn't. Like no, maybe we it, can. maybe it's helpful. All right, no, it's fine. Well, with uh, with your thirty marathons back to back, most normal people. And I, I'm using that word jokingly because I, I don't really like to frame people as normal or weird or whatever. But like yeah. most average people are going to be like, oh, that's crazy. I could never do that. And like, yeah, you can't do that because of what you've just said because yeah. you've already limited your possibility. But the thing is, you're not running 30 marathons all at once. Right. You know, when I started my marathon training plan, my first my first run was two miles and I had already run longer than that. And that's just what the plan called for. But when I ran the two miles I couldn't run 26.2 mm -hmm. and it was totally irrelevant because I had five months to get there. I had a long plan because I, I had a history of overtraining and injuring myself. So I'm like, I'm going to draw this one out really long and just make sure I build nice and slowly and have a solid base. And it, that was a great idea um, for me. And, you know, like I, my biggest training wasn't changing my mindset to not have to hyper overtrain or feel like I'm a failure if I don't. So there's a lot of mindset work in that. Um, but it's like it doesn't matter that I can't run a marathon on that first day because I'm not running it. Yeah. You know, you're not you're not doing 30 times 26.2 day one. Yeah. You don't know, need to worry about whether tomorrow is going to be doable or not, whether it's going to be too hard or your you know, your calves are going to be aching or whatever. That's not relevant right now. Yeah. And if you make all of your decisions and focus on that right now, even though your capability is completely different now from what you're worried about it being tomorrow, you're throwing something away. Yeah. So. You put each of those successive actions and it like it doesn't matter if it's about a marathon or paying bills or going to work or w whatever. We all have things that we have to do on an ongoing basis that if you look at it in totality, it's way too much and you never start. Yeah. So you have to remind yourself like I'm not none of those things is happening right now except the step I'm taking this very second. That's all I need to think about. And I've been watching your videos on Instagram, you coming through the finish line <laughs> It may, and maybe I'm like, I haven't seen the whole, whole things. So I don't know, you know, how you were in other miles, but typically you can, I, I seem at least to think I can tell when someone's really been struggling in a marathon and then finds that last little sprint for like the last 20 yards <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. to just power through. You don't, you don't look like you're suddenly calling up this reserve that wasn't there just to power through the end. You look like you've just had a fantastic run. Like it looks enjoyable and positive. And that <laughs> yeah. to me is someone who's every step matters and you're not looking at how many more there are to go. You're you're getting the most out of each one of those steps yeah. that you can. I love watching that. Now maybe you're feeling something different, but as a as a spectator to the video, that's what I'm picking up. Oh, that's good. Very very nice to hear. I mean, no, mate. I mean, I, maybe it's a it, it's a good example. Like I I think I I understand that my race is is or that I'm running is one marathon a day, and I just repeat it thirty times, and I've had that in my head a lot, but. I, I still I still think, you know, and like we were saying before that you naturally think about, for example, at the weekend, I have to go and run a marathon in this place. So you sort of, it's on your mind and the logistics, but there's no point. I think the only thing that's actually on my mind is logistics, um, just yes. because I have to finish at certain locations and do certain things. And, you know, just, just before we started recording today, I was talking to my wife about tomorrow's run, you know, um, and, and because I think by nature, we become quite OCD in our scheduling. Like I love to be able to look at my calendar for the next week and know exactly what's going on. So, you know, you kind of, yeah. you, but there is this line, isn't there, of, of looking at your calendar and knowing what's going on next week, but then still living today for what today is and for what you have to achieve in that particular day. Yeah. 
I think that's yeah. um, I, I think that's the the important thing. So, mate, finish finishes off finish off the marathon story for us. You started out; it was it was two miles on the first day. How did it progress? What did you learn from it? Um, it was unbelievably educational. Um, it progressed generally really well, except there was one period where I stopped doing a day. Right. Uh, you know, so to, so to speak, um, I got injured during a tempo run where, you know, you got to kick up your pace pretty significantly for, you know, middle block of miles. It was like an eight miler. And I, I think the middle five were higher paced for whatever reason. Those are the ones I like the least. I'm right. good with intervals. I'm good with distance. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know what it was, but I was sort of lukewarm on them. And then I had one, um, I was pressed for time. I was trying to get home to meet this guy for lunch um, there was a huge thunderstorm brewing. And so I was like, I got to get back. And I just, I had all, all this anxiety and pressure on me to finish. And, um, I, I hit one point, I was like a mile and a half from home and, and uh, I felt a snap oh. in, I was going to say my right leg. I actually don't remember which leg it was. I think it was my left huh. way down in my calf muscle. Right. And that, so I, I stopped dead in my tracks. I literally couldn't move. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I'm, um, I start massaging it and I'm just trying to like, you know, feel where the, you know, the, the tissue is and all that kind of stuff. And, and I get to a point where I can sort of hobble. Um, I can hobble a little bit faster and then I'm, I'm still like, I can't do more than walk. And then my wife drives by. She's like, I knew the storm was coming. I'm trying to find you. You didn't have your phone with you. Like, thank God. She's like paroling the, uh, the neighborhood. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was getting closer to home. Um, so I, I ended up getting home and, um, it just, it, it's just kind of a, a mess from there. I'm, I'm like, I wrapped it for compression. I got ice on it. Um, I was late to meet that guy. And <laughs> then I'm like, what do I do? Cause I have to keep running or the marathon's not going to happen. And now I've just, I'm like, I don't know, 40% of the way through the training. Right. Uh, and I'm like, that's it. Marathon's over. I'm never going to get to run it now because I'm too injured to even walk comfortably. Uh, And I had given up other things I really enjoyed. Like I was really into road cycling. I'm like the only person I know who hasn't had a horrific crash. So I gave up road cycling for marathon training because I was like, I don't want to miss the marathon because I went out for a nice bike ride. So I'm like, I gave all this stuff up and now I can't do the marathon. And I just started ruminating like crazy in my head. And I caught myself. and I'm like, all right, stop it. You have recovery techniques. You have I've, – I've learned that uh, my body responds to acupuncture really well. Acupuncture is actually what broke my wife's downward cycle, and we didn't really, wow. like, believe in it, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I went to the acupuncturist, and, and within a week, I was at a point where I could jog again. I probably shouldn't have yet, but that week I basically took to rework my mind because I'm like, I recognize that I was broken. So I did a lot of – I blogged on it. I journaled about it. Um, I did a lot of meditation and I just did other things for my body, you know, non-running exercise to just try to keep my fitness, my joint movement. But I went through a dark period with that. Um, but I recognized it. And one of the important things about do a day is like, it's not like you just learn it and you're done and then your yeah. life's perfect. People are like, Oh, you're, you're so honest about your struggles. Like, yeah, cause I'm human and I still struggle <laughs> and I have plenty of moments of anxiety and plenty of moments where you know, like either I call myself out or some people will call me out like Brian do a day. I'm like, Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's totally fine. Back to self love. Uh, cause you're not going to recognize it, correct it and move forward in a positive and reinforcing way. If you just sit there beating yourself up. So I, I went through that. Um, I was very nervous every time I came to that same place, um, uh, geographically in my training. So I changed my, my route which is fine. Like I should have the variety anyway, but yeah, every tempo run after that, I definitely felt a little bit queasy inside and that was carrying past pain into the present moment. And I'll tell you, Marcus, I didn't hit my pace on any single tempo run (laughs) up until like a month before the marathon, Uh. because part of my mind was still stuck in the past and I was holding back. But what if, you know, what if that snaps again? And yeah. And guess what? It never did. It never did. That's amazing. And I mean, it that's, now the marathon didn't actually go well. <laughs> so tell us about it. Which is wild. <laughs> yeah. So like five months of training, and and if I wasn't in a do a day kind of place, I'd be like, it's all in the toilet. 
because that was a hundred percent waste because I should have been sub four uh, four hours and I was four 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 twenty eight. But uh-huh. um, yeah, I, I ended up getting sick like two days before, and so I didn't sleep for two days. I was like, I don't get gross, but like you know, borderline throwing up. Yeah, um, I probably shouldn't have done it, but I just was like, oh, it's just nerves. You know, it's my first marathon. Who you know. Yeah. Like you t- and and that's a perfectly viable explanation, but I ended up like I had a fever and I didn't know any of that at the time. Um, so yeah, I started walking at like mile 15, I was just in intense pain. I looked at the medical tent every mile. I'm like, should be like, am I being stupid here? Am I putting my life in jeopardy? Um, but I made it and I walked for, from 16 to, I don't know, somewhere in the early twenties with a little bit of jogging here and there. Um, I met a really inspiring guy he ended up being a preacher which i didn't like i didn't even realize at the time but i'm like wow he's so positive and so inspirational and supportive and he was walking too so he was in a tough place now i know like that's kind of his work uh, um, but yeah I did, you know i got through it um mentally I, I was in a bad place about it for a couple of days just feeling that loss but i also knew i needed to go through that and then i reflected on it i wrote about it i think writing is, is really cathartic yeah um and what I realize is and my next one's going to be a PR because this one wasn't. So at least I'll just do better next time because I got there's definitely much faster pace in me than what I was able to achieve. Yeah, um, that's cool. So you look at it positively. When's your next one? Is it is it planned? What's the story? It's not planned yet. My last job made it very hard to find space to do it. Um, and I was only home two days a week, so I couldn't really be like, you know, half of one of those days I'm going to be out for a long run and then basically like despondent on the couch cause I can't move. Yeah. Uh, but now I'm, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm just three weeks in starting to get back into running a bit more. Um, so I'm starting to think about what, what would make sense timing wise. Um, you know, I'm from Boston, Boston marathon would be pretty amazing. I missed it for this year for the sign up. Yeah. Um, that would the charity be, I ran yeah. Chicago for wants me to run Boston for them, so I could get in next year. Wow, that would be that would be very cool, mate. Talk yeah. us through a little bit about what you're going to be doing. I'm I'm, I'm going to we'll we'll give all the links to all of your site and your social media just just before the end. But talk to us now about like what what are you what's Brian doing now, and what's the focus for you for the coming months? What can we get excited yeah. about? So there's there's just three things that I. I'm focused on one is I have a second book that has made very little progress over the past few months or year because I've been so busy. Um, my second Ted talk is on that theme. So people can find out about it. It's called the 50, 75, 100 solution. So I would like to finish writing that by the end of the year and then go into the editing phase. So that's one thing. Um, but outwardly focused, what people can find is, um, I, you know, I do coaching. So whether it's executive coaching in a business setting or one-on-one with individuals sort of life coaching, um, so that's a, a major focus for me. Then the other is a speaking and, um, that's, that's what I'm probably putting the most effort into is getting more speaking activity. Right. There is nothing like taking a stage and watching people connect with your message and get yeah. fired up by it and get moved. And I, you know, I love the book. I love the coaching. I love all that kind of stuff. But to see like the last time, the last event I did was three weeks ago. There were 650 people in the room wow. and just to watch that reaction. And I did, I did the do a day talk, a version of my Ted talk on it. Like that is unreal. So that's, that's what I want to be doing. I've got a number of different talks that I do, but to be able to connect with an audience like that and have people come up, I've never done one where someone hasn't come up to me in tears afterward. Wow. That's what this is all about, man. It's about helping people change their lives. So to get to see that in real time, that's pretty amazing. Well, mate, I think that's uh, yeah, that's something that people should definitely. Are your are there are the TEDx talks that you've done? Are they available online? There, yeah, they're all available. Um, so everything's at brianfelchuk.com, and the TEDx talks are brianfelchuk.com slash TEDx. Awesome. I've done two of them, one on do a day. So if you uh, if you don't have a couple hours to read the book, you can get the gist of it in fifteen minutes and see if it's worth a couple hours. <laughs> uh, we were saying before it's it's not a terribly long book. No, and that's it's a very point. easy read as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a super easy. I don't book. I don't want people spending time with my words. I want my words to get them to spend time with themselves. So it's not like you know a long arduous book. There's no it's not a workbook like. It just read it, take it in, and start thinking about yourself and what things mean to 
you like take the questions in the book and start getting introspective, but spend the time with yourself, not with my writing. Yeah, I think that's, and I think, I mean, as I said, as, as we said before, we started recording a, a mutual friend connected us and sent me your book. And I think I read it in within a day and I was, and, and it just, it does exactly that. I think it, it just makes you think. And I think if you gave me a test on the book, I'd probably fail because I can't remember all of, <laughs> all of the details, but I can, rem- I could write uh, 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 pages of actually how it made me think and how it made me feel. That's and what I, it's for. And, yeah. yeah. So I actually, as long haven't... as you know the title, I don't care. You yeah. don't need to remember <laughs> any. Sp- yeah. Even me, like, look, when people ask me, they're like, you know, tell us about whatever from the book or people have quoted the book when I've been interviewed. And I'm like, I don't even remember writing. That. <laughs> like, it's my words. I'm like, wow, that's, br-. and they're like, so that's from your book. I'm like, go me. Yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. That's so good. Well, mate, I think, I think that's, uh, I think it's awesome what you've done. And I, I think it's, mate, from, from the interaction that we've had so far, I'm sure you're going to be, uh, you're going to be super successful, mate, as well. So Thanks, it's, um, one, uh, mate, what we should, so if, if folks want to connect with you, Brian Falchuk.com, B R Y A N, and I'll put this in the show notes as well, F A L C H U K dot com. Go and check Brian's site out, and if your TED Talks are on there, as you said, mate, I think they're definitely, like you said, I think that's a very nice way to put it. Watch my 15 minute TED Talk. If you like it, read my book. Um, I think yeah. that's a, and, and, and you're also over on Instagram at, at Brian Falchuk as well, so people can. Uh, yeah, and Twitter and, and Facebook and all awesome, that. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, you know, I'll give a, for your listeners, I'll, I'll throw a discount in on, usually I charge more for a signed copy of the book because I, I actually like write a full note. I don't just write my name. Oh, wow. Um, but if, if people go to brianfeltrock.com slash inner fight, wow. um, I'll throw in a $5, $5 off coupon so you can get the book. Uh, same price as, as the regular one from Amazon or wherever. You um, are a legend, mate. I'll stick cool. that in the show notes as well just in case you missed that, folks. We'll stick that in. That's very kind of Brian to, to give us that, mate. That's awesome. Mate, I won't take any more of your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to, to have you on. And I, what I'm actually really excited about is to get you back or around a year, six months to a year from now, because I can feel that you'll have done some quite incredible things in that time. So if, uh, if you're not too busy to speak to us again with it within the next year, mate, I think that'd be something really oh, awesome sure. to, see, to yeah. see what's going on. Um, yeah, and I got to find a reason to come out to Dubai. I've, I got a n- number of speaker friends who are doing talks in Dubai. I'm like, I got to get one of those and then actually get to meet you in person. That would be, That'd be awesome. awesome. And come to the yeah. gym and have a workout and then do a talk at the gym. That would be even better. Oh, for sure. <laughs> awesome. Folks, that is Brian. Brian, thank you so much for your time. And I just hope people hop over to the site. I found your book really, really useful. So thank you for what you've done for me. And thank you for what you're going to do for a lot of other people as well. Awesome, Marcus. Thanks so much for having me on. Awesome, mate. Have a fantastic day. It's the start of the start of the day, start of the week where you are. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have a good one. Good stuff. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks a lot. 